Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Frontline Club. Um, this session is one of a series called uh, Reflections, in which we ask uh, accomplished and leading journalists to uh, look back at seminal moments in their own career, their work, their influences, and their inspirations. Uh, and in doing so, uh, I hope give us some insights into the craft and practice and possibly the future of uh, journalism. Uh, the way it works, I know some of you will have been to these before, but um, we ask uh, our guests to select some <laughs> clips which have some meaning or some importance to them, uh, and then we'll talk around them up here. And I promise uh, I'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. I've said before, this is a kind of conflation of This Is Your Life and Desert Island Discs. Uh, only much better. Um, <laughs> Our guest this evening is the special correspondent for Sky News. Um, she's just moved to uh, South Africa a couple of months ago, which takes her a little nearer to the place that she grew up. Uh, she grew up in Nigeria, uh, then uh, Zambia, and then went to school. Miles. Sorry? 2,000 miles. Well, 2,000 miles, but it's, as I said, it's Same a little continent. bit nearer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got trouble in the front row already. <laughs> 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 um, um Went to school in Zimbabwe, which was then, of course, uh, Rhodesia. Um, her first work experience was with the Rand Daily Mail, uh, and then her first proper job was at the Wokingham Times in Berkshire. Is that still going? Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, she then went to, uh, had spells at the BBC, uh, at TVAM, uh, and finally rocked up at Sky in uh, 1989. Uh, extraordinarily, um, it's hard to believe this actually, but she's only been a foreign correspondent for six years. But even more extraordinarily, uh, in that time, she has uh, won the Royal Television Society Journalist of the Year three times, uh, and that is very annoying for ITN and uh, <laughs> BBC. Uh, uh, and for those of you who like a flutter, you might want to go to the bookies actually, because uh, I think there's a very strong chance that will rise to four this year. You won't get very good odds, I don't think. Um, the citation for this year's RTS award um, read that she showed complete mastery of the reporter's art, tremendous enterprise, polished writing, and great screen presence, together with remarkable personal courage and the ability to work under sustained pressure in dangerous places. Can't say much more than that. She won the James Cameron Award last month, I think, actually, uh, at City University at which it was said uh, she is an outstanding role model, not just for students embarking on their careers, but for the whole industry. Uh, she has reported from so many places, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Asian tsunami, the death of the Pope, uh, Hurricane Katrina and the Iraq war, and then, of course, a whole raft of Arab Spring uprisings in the recent time. Uh, now, of course, um, a few months ago, she was... Uh, fated for her extraordinary journey into uh, Tripoli on the back of a truck with a rebel convoy, and we will hear a bit more about that as the evening goes on. Uh, she is known to all her colleagues at Sky as Crawfy. Uh, she is, of course, and please welcome Alex Crawford. So, Alex, you're, you're, you're based in Johannesburg. Does that mean you, you, you're covering Africa, but then going elsewhere if they want you to, or how does that work? That's exactly how it works. That's it, is it? Oh, no, I begged, I've been wanting to work in Africa for a long time, and um, this was the opportunity, but they don't want me just to do Africa. So um, I have to try and com combine it with some interesting Africa. So, but of course, a lot of the, I mean, Libya and, you know, a lot of them oh, yeah. are in Africa. It's just that we don't see them as Africa. Yeah, OK. Let's go right back to the beginning. Uh, tell us about um, Nigeria and uh, Zambia. Um, well, my parents met and married in Nigeria, so um, we spent our early years in Nigeria, um, and then uh, they moved to Zambia. Um, and I went to just a, we lived in a small copper mining town called Kitwe, and um, where there was um, no theatre, no TV, no nothing. So it was very, it was very basic, but absolutely wonderful childhood. Um, just went to a local little um, convent school until uh, they thought they need, we needed to get slightly better education at that stage. Rhodesia was doing uh, considered better schooling, so they sent us to school in Rhodesia very soon after that. The civil war began in Rhodesia and everything shut down apart from allowing school children across 
um, and um, they went through a lot of turmoil in Rhodesia. But you know, by the time, and that's why we left, ended up leaving, because it was, we were learning terrorist drill at school as well as fire drill. And uh, it was, everyone was fleeing the country, and most of them were going to South Africa. But um, because apartheid was there, um, my parents didn't want to go to South Africa, so we ended up sort of coming back to England, and I finished my schooling here. But from the moment we landed back in England, I wanted to go back to Africa. Has that been influential in, in wanting to go to Joburg now? Or? Oh, yeah. yeah. spent my entire career trying to get trying back to, get to back Africa. Um, uh, but, I mean, you know, when I got Asia correspondent in India, I, it kind of felt like it was second prize, but it, it was just hugely interesting, and I loved Asia. I just thought it was fantastic. And, um, so was there a point uh, at which you thought, I know what I want to do now, I want to be a journalist? I always wanted to be a journalist. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I didn't quite realise it because um, uh, I was, I, I went, you know, I was applying to do law and things like that because it certainly sounded quite sort of grown up and things. But I was even when I was at school, I started the school newspaper and um, was running uh, radio, uh, you know, doing voluntary radio, hospital radio and things, but not really thinking of it as a career because I was enjoying it. You know, so I needed to think of a proper career that was, so I thought about lawyer or something, but I was hopelessly not terribly academic. And it was my mother who said, why don't you try for the newspaper, this newspaper training course? And then began a whole series of rejections. <laughs> <laughs> and when I finally got on the, um, the uh, newspaper training course, the Thompson Regional Newspaper Training oh, yeah. Course, I realised that I'd applied to every single newspaper that was on, and been rejected by all of them that were, you know, and finally persuaded this lovely Scottish editor to take me on at the Wokingham Times. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's, so he was a great Scottish character. It was Adam McKinley, and he was like a, a real a mentor. I mean, he was a fantastic character. He was like a reformed alcoholic who'd worked on Fleet Street, but loved encouraging young um, journalists like like me at that stage. So he, and, and there's loads of people st in Fleet Street, or the old Fleet Street now, who came from the Wakingham Times. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was great. It was a great training ground. Okay. So um, introduce your first piece, um, Alex. It's 1984. Where was that in your career? Um, I was in BBC Radio Nottingham right. at that stage, because the, the Live Aid concert came uh, after that, and everyone was, uh, first of all, it was a stunning bit of journalism. I mean, it's kind of like what I think what most um, journalists, well, what certainly what I would aspire to, to do something that actually changes world events like that, that inspires um, thousands and thousands of people to pledge money. Um, and, I, and I thought, Michael Burke, I mean, when I finally ended up at the BBC and worked with Michael Burke, it was like working with a hero. Uh, he, you know, and he, he was a presenter at that stage, doing the um, one o'clock news and things, and, and saying, um, you know, d this isn't really a grown-up job. And I, was, I just thought that was fantastic because that was I'd rather eat my own liver than be a presenter, <laughs> uh, because it was, wasn't out in the field, and he felt exactly the same. You know, he'd kind of given up all the fantastic adventures and being able to do stuff like cover the Ethiopian famine and make people care about it. Uh, and I like the way you put it into perspective because a lot of the, what was really disappointing is when um, people come on work experience or come to Sky and, and they say what they want, to, they haven't worked anywhere and what they want to do is just be a presenter. It's like, why do you want to do that? Why on earth do you want to sit in a studio and read auto cue? It's not, it's like, to me, it's, uh, you know, that's not what journalism's about. Dawn, and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Corum, it lights up a biblical famine, now in the 20th century. This place, say workers here, is the closest thing to hell on earth. Thousands of wasted people are coming here for help. Many find only death. They flood in every day from villages hundreds of miles away, dulled by hunger, driven beyond the point of desperation. 15,000 children here now, suffering, confused, 
lost. Death is all around. A child or an adult dies every 20 minutes. Coram, an insignificant town, has become a place of grief. The relief agencies do what they can. Save the Children Fund are caring for more than 7,000 babies. Every day they weigh them on a sling, then compare their weight with their height. By this rule of thumb, one in three is severely malnourished, starved to the point of death. This morning, another 114 babies have arrived. The choice of who can be helped and who can't among the constant stream of newcomers is heartbreaking. There's not enough food for half these people. Rumours of a shipment can set off panic. As on most days, the rumours were false. For many here, there would be no food again today. Still, that's probably the most influential piece of television mm. news ever broadcast. I actually, can't think it? of it, uh, one that yeah. has had such an impact on so many people, because it wasn't even just Britain, was it? It went round mm. the world. Mm. I mean, you know, what more can you ask from a piece than that? Um, do, do you think, that, that, at the time, that was incredibly shocking, mm. uh, that piece, and yet it feels well, no, we've rather been... familiar now, doesn't it? Well, actually, it was, I love, I like the way he scripted it. It was, it's still very moving. The scripting yeah. is is very um, touching, but uh, but we've be, we've become sort of, I think, as a as TV viewers, we've become a bit desensitised. Um, and um, the Arab Spring is a case in point. You what know. do you mean? Well, I think um, when it started in Tunisia, everyone was like shocked at the water cannon and. <laughs> And, they, and each one got worse and worse. And then you went to Egypt, and it's like, whoa, that's a lot of people. And oh my God, they're shooting them. And then it, it, it kind of spilled on. Bahrain was another step higher. And then Libya was like off the Richter scale of danger and risk taking and brutality. And, uh, what, what is your role as a correspondent, Alex, in, that, in, in saying to the viewer, actually, this is extraordinarily important? I mean, is that about adding extra context to the, rather than just reporting what you're seeing, or what? Um, well, I think that's the challenge on every piece you do. Because, like, when I was in India doing domestic slavery stories, the first, the first thing you've got to do is get it past the producer, get the producer interested enough to put it in his program. So you've got, you've got your fighting battles all the time. And they, it used to really annoy me when they say, well, that's just a feature. So, no, actually, this is, this is quite important. And I think if you can't actually even convince the producer, you're not going to have a damn hard job convincing any viewer who's watching it. You know, because you've got to get people, you've got to engage people, and you've got to get them to want to watch it, and you've got to explain why it's important. Yeah. So I think that's a challenge for any reporter on any story. OK, I know there's a lot of students here who are always interested in career moves, so um, can you talk a little bit about your path through the BBC and TVAM? Um, well, BBC was... Um, I went from my training newspaper. I got taken on on one of their um, the BBC training course. Um, and they, they... You know, the BBC is still the best train, training. I mean, I can't believe they're still... They're not, apparently, they're not running the training course anymore. And it's... it's it's still so the best. were you a news trainee? No, I would yeah. taken on to um, BBC the B the radio training program, right. which where I joined the news trainees, and then they put me on a TV training thing where I joined the news trainees. But I wasn't. I'm not really sure what the difference was. But I think I think the difference was they went to Oxford and Cambridge, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> And then, so you moved, we, so we, when you were at the BBC, were you a reporter or a producer or...? No, I went to the BBC as a sub-editor. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I, I, I did radio. Yeah. First I did radio, so I was taken on as a producer, which in, in local radio means you're reporting anyway. It's kind of like yeah. you just, it's just a different salary hierarchy. Um, and then I got taken on, a, on an attachment at um, BBC um, Television Centre. And um, didn't, it was actually just meant to be an attachment. It turned out into a job, and I left local radio early, too early for me, because it was such fun. Local radio, radio was great fun. Um, and ended up in the t television um, centre being a sub-editor and write, you know, spending all day writing a 30-second 
live voiceover for each of the, and it was like oh, deadly dull. I mean, great training because you're you're sitting next to people like Michael Burke and you're being taught by people who know so much and you're having to work with reporters who um, like Martin Bell and uh, who were very, very um, inspiring. Learned a lot, but it, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I was desperate to be out in the field and be reporting. And I remember going and um, uh, sort of asking if I could. Um, how I could be a reporter, and at then it was it was very different then because there weren't there weren't these huge number of television stations, and it was it was quite a long thing. And I remember um, Chris Kramer saying, "Well, you'll have to do an attachment at intake, an attachment in planning, an attachment in this," and, it, and it was a real off. And I thought, by that stage, I'm going to be 25. My <laughs> life's going to be over. You know what I mean? So then I got I got a um, I went, applied to TVAM which was, and uh, resigned from the BBC, which you just never did. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. the, the BBC was like, why on earth would you want to leave the BBC? You know, you're crazy. And then I, I joined and I was doing my three months, um, uh, you know, the, the, the last three months before you take up the new job and, and TV, yeah, three months notice and TVAM went on strike. It was like, oh my God. What, um, really stupid, giving up this BBC job, going to a place that's just gone on strike. Um, so, uh, and, and TVM was, it, was, it wasn't, it was a, I stayed there for a year because I felt I couldn't leave any sooner, but it was a <coughs> bad time. And so you went to Sky in 1989? Yeah, and then Sky started. And was that, so you were at the very launch yeah, of Sky? Yeah, I, I was at the launch and I was taken, still trying to be a reporter, but taken on as a producer, but they quickly switched me to reporting within about seven months. Um, and so I did um, lots of domestic reporting and fighting to get on foreign jobs, which were always the best ones. Um, and that went on for you know about eighteen years. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, d I have to ask this, but given that you got there in nineteen eighty nine, mm. there were sixteen years where you mm. weren't a foreign correspondent. What happened in the? Well, why spent, did it take I so long? I spent ten years having children. Ah, right. Yeah, um, sure, yeah. And yeah. and each time uh, I come back and um, well, I thought when I was in the middle of having children that it was going to be tricky to persuade anyone to send me away to a foreign to a foreign bureau, which was the 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 best job, you know, as far as anyone, you know, who was reporting wanted yeah. to do. That was considered this sort of creme de la creme. And it was difficult when you're sort of, you're waddling through the, no, seriously, I can do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, then, then you'd have the baby and you spend a lot of time getting, you know, I'd come back, I'd come straight back and they'd think, well, you've had six months holiday. I was put you back on night shift for um, about six, six or eight weeks. And I remember one, after one maternity leave, counting the first 22 stories I did were all baby or mother related. It was all creches and VAT on this sort of, it's like, so each time you felt as though you went back to the beginning and had to come, had to work your way back up to. Did, did you have, a, was there anyone at Sky who you felt was a mentor or someone, you know, you really appreciated there? Um, well, I mean, John alone who started who was our very first head of news is still a mentor. I mean, I still meet him regularly. He was a fantastic um, Australian um, guy who just uh, those, the, the the Australian contingent who came over were very yeah. good for the uptight British lot. They sort of broke ev broke down all the barriers and they added a lot of fun and they were quite rebellious and and a lot of all the um, the people who joined Sky at the beginning were disenchanted BBC or disenchanted IN ITN people or in my case I was disenchanted TVAM you know we all went there sort of feeling um, we want had something to prove and everyone was very young the average age was about 25. Then, so it was a very young, sort of vibrant, rebellious, uh, and and everyone, all the other, the terrestrial televisions, just laughed at us. <laughs> yeah, um, it was a British took, version of Chicken Noodle. Yeah, network, it was. It? Yeah. Uh, um, so John alone was definitely mental, but there, and there've been, you know, there's been quite a few. I mean, Simon Bucks is ex ITN. Um, he was, he still is, and he's still in. I mean, I think he's fantastic. Very, you know, lots of people guide you and and pulls of wisdom which you grab greedily at, and he's still doing that. Well, perhaps you'll pass someone as the evening goes <laughs> on. Uh, let's have a look at your next uh, piece. What, do you want to introduce it? I don't know whether anyone remembers Matt Fry when he was Asia correspondent for BBC, but I do. I used to watch all his stuff and think, 
when I grow up, I want to be that guy because he writes, he wrote so beautifully, and it is, um, and almost every any piece you picked from that time uh, when he was Asia correspondent was just beautiful. It was beautifully scripted. He brought, I mean, East Timor. I didn't even know where it was, <laughs> and yet he made me interested in it. And I think this piece, we just had a brief look at it before we came on, and it was, uh, it's stunning stuff. I mean, really stunning stuff. Um, I think I still think he's one of the best writers. <coughs> An afternoon in Dili. Time for war. A dirty war. These were pro-independence supporters setting up barricades to defend their neighborhood from anti-independence militia. Theoretically, their dispute is about whether East Timor should belong to Indonesia. In practice, they like to kill each other. Watch the man getting hit by the rifle. He supports independence. But not the men chasing him with machetes. Fresh from their kill, the militias now turn their attention to us journalists. We were trapped, and the person being beaten is my BBC colleague, Jonathan Head. He was lucky to get away with a few bruises. This attack was unusual because it took place outside the UN compound. With the militia on our heels, cameraman Darren Conway and I ran to take refuge. Hurry up. Back, back from the gate now. Out. Back now. Having set fire to nearby houses, the militia surrounded the UN headquarters. They hate the organization for presiding over the referendum on independence. And the UN is at their mercy. Unimet staff, please move into the auditorium. There are people on the hill with guns. We don't need you outside. The only protection comes from the Indonesian police. There are thousands of them. They could easily control the militia, but they don't. It took them a whole hour to get here. By now, hundreds of civilians were streaming into the compound, desperate for sanctuary. Only two days after their first ever taste of democracy, these people faced the abyss once again. Those who'd made it in were now trying to get their relatives down from the hills. But that meant running the gauntlet of militia gunfire. In their yearning for independence from Indonesia, these people pose a threat to the rest of this vast country. The fear is that if they break loose, it may trigger the nation's unravelling. One reason, perhaps, why the Indonesian authorities are doing so little. Tonight, the UN mission in East Timor is well and truly under siege. There are militia gunmen in the hills just outside here, shooting at the compound. And this room, which we normally use for press conferences, has been turned into a refugee camp. While the refugees stayed behind, we were taken in a police truck to our hotel, past the militia roadblocks, through a city under siege in a country on the brink of civil war. At the port, we found hundreds of people trying to leave by boat, any boat. These are mainly settlers from other parts of Indonesia, now too frightened to stay. This family took everything, including the kitchen sink. Some of them have come from islands now also striving for independence. They're a reminder that what's at stake in East Timor is not just the liberty of one people, but the breakup of the world's fourth most populous nation. Matt Fry, BBC News, Dili. It's amazing, isn't it? Because he packed about three or four mm -hmm. stories in one. one. I mean, you could have broken that up and had each, you know, each section, what was happening to them, would have yeah. been a, a story in itself. Yeah. And also, I thought, I don't know, I thought he, did, did anyone agree? I just thought that was amazing. And it's great. English isn't his first language. No. Look, it's German, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even more remarkable. Yeah. Very annoying. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what are, you're a fantastic packager, Ali. So what are, the, what are the component parts of a really good television package? Well, with te unfortunately, with television, um, which sets, you know, you're governed by pictures. And uh, again, with Matt, he had a very good cameraman with him. Yeah. You gave, I mean, you know, sometimes you're just, you're just waiting for those gifts to drop in your lap, and the cameraman caught everything. You know, the running, the Jonathan head being beaten up, the machetes. I mean, it was all fantastic stuff. And actually, 
if you can't, in a way, I mean, Matt did it brilliantly, but in a way, you, 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 he's, he's been given a, sort of a beautiful gift wrapped package and he yeah. just needs to hand it over. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you're, you've got to have a good cameraman and you've got to work well together and they were working really well, running together. And, you know. yeah. Okay. Well, how long was that? It felt to me as though that was four, about five minutes. About or four, four something, I would yeah. say. I mean, usually... Oh, three usually, and a half minutes. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Gosh, they packed a lot in. Um, um, I, usually it's about an hour a minute, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you, obviously you have to do, you, many times you have to do a lot quicker than that, and you're sacrificing. Um, it, it also depends on the picture editor you have. I mean, the, that the cameraman, Darren Conway, was also the picture editor. He's remarkably quick, so yeah. um, uh, that kind of depends as well. Yeah. Um, what about writing? Do you, do you have any kind of your own rules about writing to pictures? Well, um, the, my my only rule is it's got to be really simple, you know. And um, and and if people don't understand it, the, the the cameraman doesn't understand it, or the producer who's watching isn't quite sure, or the, you know, if they are asking questions, then I don't even argue with them because if they're asking questions, it's there's going to be a whole there's going to be millions more after them who still don't understand it, and it, and. Um, I'm quite a simple creature, so if I don't understand it, I'll, you know, I'll write, try and write really simply. Because you don't need flowery language, and you don't um, want cliches. So most of the time you're battling to stop yourself using cliches. I don't want to use something that's so commonplace that it's, you want to use unusual, yeah. or different, or just very direct. This is staying on the craft skills thing, yeah, and, and we're going to see some of your live coverage later, but um, I know some correspondents whose names you would know who are absolutely terrified of doing live broadcasting, partly because they don't do it very much, actually. Um, but you, you're a really consummate live performer. Um, you're incredibly natural on camera. And I just, you're staring into this inanimate glass and plastic thing, but you come through the camera as though you are talking to people quite naturally. What's the knack to that? What, how do you go about preparing a live broadcast? Well, one of the reasons why I was turned down for the many foreign correspondents John the Plymouth was that I couldn't do live. Um, and I think... They, they felt you couldn't do yeah, live. Yeah, they felt I couldn't do live. And they said, well, I didn't, we don't feel you're really strong enough on live. And I think um, if you know your subject, m I mean, most of the time, I mean, it's, really, it's really unusual for me to be sitting in front of an audience of people. Mostly I'm just with Garwin or Martin and we're on our own somewhere and I'm talking to Garwin or Martin and, uh, or, and the other person in my ear who's usually someone I know very well because I've worked in, at Sky for so long. So, um, you know, if I'm talking to Jeremy Thompson or Kay or whatever, it, it feels like you're just talking to a mate. Um, and I think that's probably the best approach <laughs> because if you think you're talking to an <laughs> audience well, yeah it's like oh it's a bit scary uh, do, do you prepare for a do you do, do you oh, rehearse absolutely. anything yeah how do you do that what do you do do you learn certain lines or do you no i don't bit? learn lines because that will always sound but i i want to know i want to be prepared for anything that i'm asked so i'm uh, but 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 you're doing that in your job anyway what's happening what's happening why are they like that where are they going you know is this happening so that even if the presenter doesn't ask me the right question, I'll give them something, you know, and even if I don't, uh, and I can't answer the question, because quite often, uh, when, before I became a foreign correspondent, you know, I'd be stuck outside the high court, Kay Burley would ask me a question or something, and I'd think, oh my God, I just don't know the answer there. Sorry, I, I can't quite hear what you're saying, Kay, but what I can tell you <laughs> is... <laughs> <laughs> Remember this. <laughs> But, but in, in the foreign correspondence job, usually you know far more than anyone's yeah. ever going to ask you because you're in a, in a place that they haven't been to and you're in a, in a country that they probably know little about or just have a, a very superficial thing. And you're, the job is to try and... It, actually, you feel like you've got too much information and it's trying to squash it down. And I remember someone telling me um, that don't try not to inundate them with too much um, information, information because they'll come away only actually remembering about three points you've made um, and sometimes I feel like it, 
I've got too much that I want to say, but you know, no, 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 wait, 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 don't go away. I need to tell you more. <laughs> um, and it, actually, you've got to boil it down to the, look, the important thing is they're getting in. Secondly, they're not being killed. Or thirdly, they are being killed. Or, you know, we're all, and it's all yeah. quite dangerous here. You know, just key bits of information that just get the main points across. Of course, that's, that's the difficulty when it's a really complex subject and they don't, even the presenter's not quite sure about the complexities of the thing. You have to get it over to them quickly in 15 seconds before they say, no, we've got to go to a break. We've got sport coming up. <laughs> yes, but there are people dying here. Yeah, Wait! Yeah, quite, yeah. OK, should we have a look at your next piece? Orla Guerin. I mean, fantastic uh, reporter. And um, I remember when she was based in Jerusalem, her getting so much personal criticism. I mean, having done um, a bit of coverage in um, Israel for um, a bureau cover a couple of times, I thought, I thought that was one of the, the most difficult places to work in because you get criticised by everybody. It doesn't matter what you say or how impartial or how independent you are. You're always still going to get criticism. Um, and I thought she endured, not only did she endure the entire time she was there, massive personal criticism and attacks on her coverage. I thought her coverage was amazing. She got really got inside the story. She brought it home to people, and I thought she owned that the whole time that she was there. Okay. Utterly alone and helpless, we found Hamdi today stranded in the Janin refugee camp. No more gun battles now, many militants are dead, but Israeli troops watching, not helping, this one old woman. When we stepped in, they hurried over. You speak English, it's BBC. In the end, after some pleading, the troops let us move Hamdi off the streets to safety for what passes for it here. Okay. But no safe place left for many in the camp, home to 12,000 people. This is the scene a little further on. The army brought the bulldozers through. Over a hundred fighters killed in the camp, but we saw no sign of dead bodies today. This woman claims she knows why. They killed young people, she says, and then they bulldozed them into the sewage system. But for now, no way we can check that claim. Or prove who shot Talal Tafik. We found him lying nearby. His family told us Israeli troops opened fire when he went out to buy food. Doctors can't reach him. He's been fading away for days. What are your personal rules about impartiality, Alice? Because you're, you're dealing with huge numbers of stories where there are victims. Uh, whatever, mm. whatever side they're on, they're victims, really. Um, how do you maintain impartiality in those? What do you mean by impartiality when you're covering two sides? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it's almost a fallacy that you can be impartial, yeah. you know, because um, we're, we're reporters and you know, independent journalists, however, we are humans as well. And when you're, um, you're looking at people being killed, hurt, injured, abused, you've got to be able to feel something. I, 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 sh I, I think we should stop apologizing for actually feeling what humans should feel. And as... Um, Do you think some journalism is too detached? Well, uh, personally, I, I, I mean, I'm not... I can't be detached, and I don't want to be detached, actually. The, the moment I stop feeling, there's no, you know, then probably the time to do another job. You've got to feel it. Uh, because if you, if you can't feel it, how can you, how can you report sort of um, with passion? Yeah. I, I, I think, we should, you know, it, there's a difference between being independent and being unemotional. Or you, and you don't even need to be emotional. You just need to be able to know what they're going through. Because then how, you know, I think, I think passion, you know, in the past, like, people like Anderson Cooper on CNN, I know he got a lot of criticism during the Haiti thing when he'd rescued a, a child. And um, I think Fergal came, was it Fergal? Who came under a lot of criticism when he took people in an ambulance and was filmed helping them. There are lots I mean, of examples. There's Ben, ben Brown earth? cuddling the yes. old woman. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so some of it can appear contrived. And I, I remember when, when we were in Masrata, 
Uh, we were traveling to the front line in an ambulance, and the only way we could get back was in the ambulance. And obviously, the ambulance is not going to leave the front line without having someone in it. Right. And it's a very small ambulance. So there was only room for Martin in the front with the ambulance driver, myself taking up one of the spaces in the back, and one medic who was having to look after this injured person and couldn't do it on his own. So what, what, what am I meant to do? Sit back and not help? Mm -hmm. When I've been trained in, as, as all the correspondents who go to this area have been trained first in first aid and things, what, what do I, just because I'm meant to be an independent journalist, sit by and not help a fellow human being, whatever, whether you agree with what they're doing or not, not actually help bandage him up? Mm. <laughs> in, inconceivable to me. And uh, I don't really care, you know, I don't really care what people, what criticism there is, I feel I did the right thing. Now, whether you use it in a report, <laughs> now, whether you use it in a report is a different thing. Different now, judgment, Martin yeah. filmed me doing it, and I decided not to use it in the report. Why? Because I felt I would be, it, 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 wasn't, it didn't really add anything to the report, and I thought I would draw a lot of criticism and it would detract, detract from the story. OK, uh, I want to leave plenty of time to show your pieces at the end. You'll notice that Alex has been incredibly modest here in the pieces she's chosen. You haven't seen one of hers yet, and you won't for a while, actually. Um, would you like to introduce the next piece? Well, I, thought, I think Al Jazeera has had an astonishing Arab Spring. I've worked alongside or been in the same areas as uh, many of them in covering all the Arab Spring um, uprisings and I was really impressed by many of them. I met Shireen Tadros when we were both nominated for an Emmy last year and um, I thought she was um, a, a, a remarkable woman. She's um, British uh, but also um, Arab and she's got about two degrees and a whole string of former lives before she became a journalist and I, th I just think she's um, quite an, an inspiring woman and her stuff in Gaza along with her, one of her, her fellow co-reporters from Al Jazeera was really good stuff, really good stuff, courageous and um, got, she got in there, she's quite undaunted by all the Israeli This is when criticism. the rest of the world's media was outside. Yeah, they were the only yeah. people in there yeah. Yeah. And, she, and for a long period and she's very understated <laughs> and very... Um, Oh, I, I, if you, I don't know whether many of you will have seen her, but anyway, you have a look and see if you agree. I went to the Shifa Hospital, which is the main hospital in Gaza. I was there for about 10 minutes when I started to grasp what was going on. As I was walking in through the parking lot, there were dozens of people coming towards me and they had, they had blood all over them or they were on a makeshift um, stretcher or they were just on the floor and they were bleeding. And I hadn't even walked through the front door yet. As I looked around me and I saw ambulance after ambulance of people dead and injured being either taken through that door into the ICU or taken around the back where the fridges were, it was as if the whole of Gaza was dying on that day. Ten-year-old Joma was waiting for his mother to pick him up from school when the missile hit. My head hurts so much, he tells me. And I don't know what happened to my friends. His UN school happens to be next to a police station and the strike hit at precisely the time children were going home. And I turned around to my cameraman and he looked at me and he said, that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like Gaza is dying today. And I sent him to go and film around the back where the fridges are. And he came back to me after 15 minutes and I, his face was white. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry that you had to do that. We, we need those shots. And, you know, are you okay? And he said, yes, I'm fine, but um, I just saw my cousin. It brings this home to you that everyone that you're working with your cameraman and, and your sound man and your driver, they were all living this with you. They were all suffering from what was going on. Mm. She's quite an amazing woman, isn't she? Incredible. Yeah. 
Uh, um, you know, she used to be a, she, before she became a journalist, she used to um, be an academic at SOAS. I mean, she's just amazing, I think. For me, this reminds one of the, the great unsung heroes, actually, which is all the local ba mm. locally based mm. staff and fixers and translators that we use. Um, mm. uh, I mean, you, you must use them all the time, do you? Yeah, yeah, and, um, and you feel, particularly in Afghanistan, one of the, um, I did a, um, not, not, this, the, not this, this story, but I went and spent some time with um, the Gulbuddin Hekmati militant group, which is the second major, major um, militant insurgency group in Afghanistan after the Taliban. I mean, a lot of people call them the Taliban as well, but it's a bit like, um, you know, they, they don't like being called the Taliban. They think they're a lot better. Um, and um, uh, I used, obviously, we have to use interpreters because um, don't speak the local language. And I took um, a very nice young man with me. We spent uh, nearly a week with them, living with them, eating, moving, seeing their training camps and things. And on the way out, um, things started to go wrong. And uh, the uh, militant group said, we've heard that someone's, um, the Taliban's waiting for you. We're going to take you out in the middle of the night or try and we'll take you to a safe place and get your people to pick them up. So we did all of that. And, uh, but on the way out, um, I felt that something was going to go wrong. And that's usually when things do go wrong, it's on, on, on the way out or when you first arrive. And uh, so we'd taken the precaution of taking the tapes out of, of Phil's camera, hiding them. I got him to film something, you know, scenery. Um, and we were in our, we, the, the militant guys took us and then there was a line that they, cr they couldn't cross. That was the end of their territory. So they, we were on our own then. And um, we were moving and actually our colleagues, I'd sent a message to um, Stuart Ramsey and um, produ my producer Neville Lazarus who were meeting us at the safe house in the town. And uh, before we got there, the, a car came across the road and I, I not really sure why I thought it, but I felt instinctively it was, this was a bad event. And I was actually on the phone ringing my my um, militant contact saying, who are these guys? Because they, are they yours? Because I saw guys coming out with some um, guns and they didn't look like militants. They looked to me like um, intelligence people, Afghan intelligence people. They were too well dressed and they had um, AK-47s and it, they were all too professional looking. They didn't look like they were um, militants. And, uh, and I was on the phone to him and he was saying, no, nothing to do with us, nothing to do with us. And these guys, came into the car, took us out at gunpoint, bundled us into their car, um, and then we ended up, they took everything off us. We ended up at the intelligence headquarters, the Afghan intelligence headquarters, NDS. Um, and obviously, as soon as we arrived, I was in a burqa. Uh, uh, they, <laughs> they, took, they took everything off us, all our equipment, but before they were taking the phones, I managed to get a message to Stuart, I just said intelligence, um, and then they took everything off us and um, took all our equipment and uh, I, I obviously told them straight away that we were um, um, British citizens, showed, us, showed them ID, passports and all that, I asked to make a call to the embassy, they wouldn't let me do it, I asked to make a call to my office, told them that our colleagues were waiting for us and they would be, you know, all this sort of thing. Anyway, they kept us there for about... Um, eight hours and halfway through it obviously my interpreter was with me all the time who, and he was getting more and more anxious um, and they were um, they, they just spent eight hours interrogating us then they said that they were going to move us and I thought oh my god it's just gone from bad to worse because there's absolutely no reason why they should move us I mean for, they were illegally holding us anyway um, and I just kept on thinking right I'm just just stay calm because sooner or later Stuart and Neville are going to turn up because I knew that the alarm bells would have been going ding, 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 ding. And um, anyway, thank God Stuart had, uh, they tried looking for us. They realized straight away there was a problem, especially when they couldn't get hold of any of us and all the phones were switched off and all of this. And, and he walked on to an American base and said, our colleagues have been taken um, hostage don't know who by or where, but it was in this area. They were meant to be. Uh, anyway, and the Americans 
first of all rang the intelligence office and said, we understand there's some foreign journalists, British journalists, Do you, have you seen them, heard them? Uh, and uh, they denied it. So then they sent, they had contacts in, in the intelligence office who, one was a cleaner who came in. I remember her coming in because she kind of like looked at me really, Ah, oh, there's the foreigner, and then and went and obviously went out. You know, offered some sweets or brought in tea or something. It was, and then uh, and then apparently this is what Stuart told me later. They um they they came back saying yeah there are two foreigners at least two foreigners in there. So they turned up at the office and again. The Americans. The Americans turned up with six APCs and a whole load of, but we didn't realise this because we were in a room couldn't hear anything. Um, uh, under guard, and, but apparently they walked in and said, uh, can we see the head who was with us, in, in, interview, interrogating us? So, and he left us, I remember him getting a call. It was a bit like a George Bush moment on 9-11. Oh, okay, all right, and he walked out, uh, and this is piecing the story later. Um, they'd heard that we were just about to be moved, um, and they were going to sell us on to the Taliban. Two French journalists, if you remember, were also yeah. went missing in that same area and were eventually freed after probably a ransom was paid. Or, uh, that, was the, that was the word anyway. And this guy was obviously, he'd, up, he'd been under um, <laughs> watch from the Americans for a while because they felt he was a corrupt official. And he, he was, had a business, basically, and he realized that there were Westerners in, and this meant, you know, the, the ching-ching signs and dollar signs went up in his eyes. And Anyway, um, and they, they said to him, we understand there are two um, British journalists here. Can, and he said, no, there's no British journalists here. Promise you, no British journalists. And the American guy apparently cocked his gun and said, we know there are British journalists here and we're going to search every single room until we find them. And apparently he started shaking and said, OK, they're next door. And the next thing was they burst into this room and took us all off. The, the aim of the story is that we left because we got taken back to the American base. I insisted the interpreter came with us, which is all fine. He got out of the hole. But obviously his card was well and truly marked by the yeah. intelligence um, guys. And um, um, he got death threats. Oh, we left quite quickly after that, with, within a couple of days. Um, and, uh, but Arif was left behind. And he got continual death threats. He was, uh, his family were targeted. He, they, you know, they, bullets were left in his, in his car and things like this. Anyway, and it was the Rory Peck Trust who moved in and um, managed to get him uh, a visa to Sweden where he was given um, refugee status. But that's, these people put themselves through incredible danger for us. And we're, because we're not resident in the country, they're much more at risk than we are for many reasons, because they've got no other way of getting out for a start. Um, but because of the Rory Peck Trust, yeah. there's a, there is a sort of happy ending to that one. Go online tonight and look up the Rory Peck Trust and join. <laughs> it's a fantastic organization, yeah. actually. Um, just on that, the other thing that reminds me of very briefly Alex, is, is the issue of trauma, really. I mean, you, mm. you have this extraordinary, you know, here you are at one moment in a war zone, then you're going home to your children. Um, what, what, what are your coping mechanisms for that uh, extraordinary flip -flop? Well, my coping mechanisms are, are my children <laughs> because they, they, um, they're incredibly grounding. And I have, to, I have a massive gear change in, um, in what I do because I go from being... Um, doing you know, some, some fairly high octane pressured stuff to going back and having four little people who really, really need me <laughs> and really just want me to be a mum. And, uh, and, and quite, it's quite, it is quite difficult getting back and sort of um, doing, doing stuff like homework and washing up and cleaning and all that, but it's also quite, well, it's, it's not really quite. It's very, very grounding. It's sort of like, listen. You, the most important thing is actually you're a mum, yeah. <laughs> and and they yeah. are very, very dependent on me. And, it, and even my partner is incredible. Obviously, is incredibly supportive because I couldn't possibly do this without someone who's who's being the backup at home. But um, but children really need their mums, and there's no real replacement for yeah. them.
and uh, getting so getting back that that's I, I don't know what, I don't think I would be able to cope without them because they're terribly grounding in everything they're yeah. my worst critics on everything you know and and they still want fish fingers even when you've been yeah, to Libya and, yeah, and when I I'd right. come back and say listen you you've got to eat that because um, <laughs> Uh, what about those people I've just come back with from Baghdad who would love to have that? And I remember my little daughter then, who was about four or five, saying, well, take it to the people in Baghdad then, because I don't want it. It's the wrong colour. You know. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, do you want to introduce your next piece? Oh, this, this is, is one this, of mine. This is one of yours. <laughs> um, well, this is a, a joint thing that um, Stuart Ramsey and I did. We, we spent seven months setting up trying to get in to the Taliban network and um, we finally did it in, in Afghanistan um, and he got to do um, he got to do the sort of roughy tufty meeting the militant fighters stuff and I got to do the children <laughs> we weren't typecast at all um, <laughs> anyway uh, but the children uh, they do tend to respond much better to women anyway and the militants respond much better to men so <laughs> It, it sort of worked out, but um, I thought it was, yeah, have a look. They're the children of the Taliban, the militants' eyes and ears, and they're ruthlessly exploited. We were allowed inside the inner sanctum to see the very workings of the Taliban network and witness how the next generation's becoming radicalized. Our route takes us east, to a place where the Afghan government has no remit, where foreign troops steer well clear. We've been told to wait a little bit, the light's going to go down soon and they'll feel safer moving in dusk or, or darkness and I've been told to put on my burqa so that I'm less noticeable. It's sound advice. This is Kuna and Pakistan's a two hour trek away. This is where fighters crisscross and the Taliban reign supreme. We broke bread with the same villagers who ensure the insurgency goes on, whose children now idolize the Taliban and who form the backbone of their operation. The youngsters on the edge of the circle now are the fighters of the future and this is their apprenticeship. When the Taliban need anything, we take them food and give them shelter and give them what they want. We are helping them whenever we can. We love them because the coalition forces injure and hurt us, and so we will help the Taliban as much as possible. The Taliban came down from the mountains after our friends told them where the coalition forces were are they scared of the Taliban, or do they see the Taliban as their friends? No, not scared at all, they say. Bravado, maybe. But the Taliban are heroes to these boys. We prepare their guns and take bullets to them. It won't be long before they're firing them too. Take these pictures, which we filmed a few weeks ago in Helmand, where the British forces are and see how vital the children are to the militants. As the troops patrol, children line the routes. They're befriending the soldiers, but also tipping off the waiting militants about direction and timings for an attack. The military called this a dicking screen. The children you see in the distance are dicking or studying the demining team tactics. They'll pass this on to the militants so the bombs can be buried without detection next time. The Taliban's tentacles stretch far, and by morning we'd call those really in the know, the tribal elders. These are the men the Taliban do trust and listen to. Nothing's done without their say-so. We convened our own shura, or meeting of elders, and it's not easy listening for the Western troops. We don't want the coalition forces here. When they kill one brother, the second one becomes a Taliban. We hear of so much money coming here, but can you see any roads or bridges being built here? The coalition made a big mistake. They trusted the warlords who do not represent us. They then looted the country and those people are killing us, cutting our hands and feet and taking bribes. 
We tell our children to be honest and support the government, but the government's corrupt and the coalition forces still support them. So what can we do when they turn to the Taliban? The little lads doing the fetching and carrying now are tomorrow's Taliban, learning at the feet of their fathers and just a step away from taking up arms and carrying on the fight. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Kunar. It's a beautiful piece, that is. Um, we, we, Very long, isn't it? it? Um, sorry. Don't say sorry. Uh, um, you talked about how long it took to get the access. How, what, what, what is that process of getting access? Because it was extraordinary. Um, mm. Well, um, I, can't, I can't imagine, I can't even remember how many trips Stuart and I meant, went to Afghanistan to, just to set it up, to meet people who could get us close to the Taliban. So first of all, we had to make contact with, um, uh, he, he was a very reputable person, but he had, he obviously had very um, good contacts within the actual network. So we had to gain his trust first. And then he um, introduced us to them. Then they had to trust us. Um, and they were very, very reticent about me coming along as a woman. Um, I don't think they'd heard about Alex Crawford or anything. They just didn't want a woman along, and that was so. That was a big barrier, um, uh, but uh, that that was a sort of non-negotiable thing because I definitely wasn't going to be left behind because we'd. I had the first contact and obviously wanted to be part of the project. And as I say, we there are things that a male reporter can do and things that a fem female reporter can do. And Stuart went out and did. Actually, I did ask for one of Stuart's pieces to to, to be shown, but um, we haven't. I don't think we've got it here. But he did a um, an amazing bit. We spent ages um, developing the trust with them uh, and persuading them them to show us how they laid IEDs. And um, there was there was there was lots of wariness from them because they don't a they don't want to give away all their secrets they think you're spies already that even if they take you along you're going to draw the americans or the other forces along and it's some sort of trap um so you have to once you get through all of that they then the last hurdle was they thought i was going to go along and do the id and they really didn't want to be you know because they're still they're very traditional men and they they feel that they need to look after you, especially if you're a woman, whereas a man apparently can run faster and jump far, you know, it's like, oh, you're going back to the Middle Ages here, but it's, it's no point fighting it, you have to try and work around it. And as soon as I said I wouldn't be involved, it would be Stuart, then it kind of went very smoothly and they showed him how they laid the bombs and, yeah, and it was, it was quite a, a sort of um, amazing bit of, of television. Um, seeing them work because it's like in the middle of the night it only takes about two or three of them uh, they did it all so quickly um, it was it was quite but it was also quite controversial because loads of people said we shouldn't have been talking to the Taliban at all that we, it was a bit like um, the IRA during Margaret Thatcher's times that the oxygen of publicity it's like um, and we sort of thought hang on all the, the everyone's talking about talking to the Taliban Hamid Karzai is talking about talking to the Taliban everywhere, and they, they weren't actually talking to them. So why should we be criticised for finding out a bit about their motives, their thinking, their feeling, how they operated, how they managed? Um, but we got an awful lot of criticism. We did afterwards. They made um, Stuart and I do a web, a web chat, which was more of a web witch hunt. Uh, but it, 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 and lots of the you were putting questions, the stocks, were you? yeah, yeah, yeah. Lo lots of the questions were you're putting our, our troops at risk because what happened if you got taken hostage, they'd have to come and save you and uh, people, you know, and you, why are you giving oxygen to these terrorists? And Okay, we're going to move on to the Zoe, I think. D David, can we skip a piece? Is that okay? Um, so do you want to introduce this, uh, Alex? Um, Zoe was... Um, was one of the key strategic towns in Libya which uh, Gaddafi had to take control of or keep control of if he was going to keep control of Tripoli because it was part it was it stood between him and the supply route with Tunisia 
and it had a big oil refinery there as well. So it was very, very important to the regime that they maintained control of Zawir. However, Zawir was packed full of civilians who didn't want Gaddafi. And uh, we happened to, we just arrived in Tripoli and were our remit, Martin and myself and Tim Miller's remit was basically to, we, we'd got visas and we were meant to be joining the Rixos Hotel sort of um, jamboree, but our remit from Sky was to get the real story. They'd already got a correspondent there and we were trying to get, um, we'd got into the country and now we had to try and lose the minders. And on, I went to Rixos for about 15 minutes with the team and then we broke out and ended up going to Zawir to find out what the uprising, what the situation was like then. We ended up being trapped there for the next three days and surrounded by, as Gaddafi tanks and troops surrounded the town and basically tried to crush them. They didn't think there were journalists in there. Um, and this is what we produced. <laughs> The battle goes on for three hours. <laughs> then remarkably, against considerable odds, they realize Gaddafi's men have retreated. They want the world to see the battle for Zawiya. They know Gaddafi will deny this. <laughs> then panic. There's more shooting and they think there are snipers. They're taken in an ambulance to the hospital. but the army is still about. Those crackles and whistle are our ambulance being fired on. Yeah, that's army. Gaddafi's attacks go on, and by morning all roads to Martyrs Square are littered with war wreckage. Again, the colonel's men are insisting they have control of Zawiya, and contrary reports from us are more foreign media propaganda. The authorities have cut the internet, shut down the mobile phone network, and ringed Zawiya with military checkpoints to keep their repeated attacks here secret. <laughs> The rebels in the square indicate Gaddafi's military victory here is fantasy. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Zawiya. Alex, I, I saw your camera, one of your two cameramen, Jim Foster, was quoted as saying, we didn't take any risks at all. Um, I, I just hate to see what he's doing when he does take risks. Um, um, to just talk briefly about safety because you, you are facing absolutely extraordinary decisions minute by minute in a situation like that. Um, well, that that that, so weird, that was in March, um, right at the beginning, mm. um, and we we then returned to Zawir in um, August, as just as it was about to fall, and then then that that led on to Tripoli. But Zawir in March was an uh, incredibly traumatic time for all of us. Um, never been through anything like it, hope and never go through anything like it again. It was very, very traumatic. There were so many people injured with the most appalling injuries, so many people killed, um, and um, they were very much civilians. 
very, very much civilians. The, the, the rebel army did, was, a sort of, was almost like a media catchphrase. There was no real rebel army there. It was just a town trying to stop itself from being crushed. We left, and that went on for five more months before they actually managed to, with a lot of help, extra people, people came down from the mountains and they had a lot, an awful, I mean, it was a completely different town when we went back. They had an awful lot more ammunition, weapons, they'd obviously had training, they had many more people. And it was in that then they were a rebel fighting force, but in March they were not. And um, we, we, al we almost ended up in Zawir by, well, not by accident, because we were aiming to go to Zawir, but we did not intend to be trapped there, didn't envisage being trapped there for three days. Um, so it was, that was more a survival thing. Later on in um, August, when we went back, then there were much more key decisions to be made yeah. about what we do, how far we go, where, where, where we you know, where we draw the line, and, and, and those, those were different decisions. But in Zawir in March was more, we, I mean, we were trapped, and we had to somehow get out of that. And, and it was, we felt we had a, a moral responsibility as we were the only people who'd actually witnessed it. And at that time, remember, Gaddafi was still saying, people were still taking him quite seriously, you know, in the international community at that stage. Uh, he was saying, his regime was saying that they weren't attacking civilians, that they had Al-Qaeda people who'd inf infiltrated the towns and were causing this. And we appeared to, we, you know, we were in the fortunate or unfortunate position of actually having absolute cast iron evidence that this was not the case. Um, so that, you know, that, that, that wasn't really, that, there wasn't really a question of taking decisions about safety then. We, yeah. we felt we were in we were trapped and we had to somehow get yeah. the pictures out and we had a moral duty to get that out and, and the no-fly zone whether you agree with it or not the, those pictures formed quite a I, I think were quite influential and no fly it Decision. gave it gave a lot of um, meat to David Cameron and yeah. Nicholas Sarkozy's argument that there needed to be a no-fly zone and then things started to change they just took an awful long time okay take us on to your last piece now um, this it, is this the is the most recent. This is the most recent bit, and um, led to the um, led to the fall of Tripoli and the eventual fall of the regime. And um, we would we were uh, I think because of everything that we'd <coughs> endured in Zawir. I mean, when we returned, the, we met up with many of the same people. They were still there fighting. Many of the doctors <coughs> recognized us from the hospital, um, many of people in the mosque. And by that time, Sky News was, was um, sort of quite well known amongst the, um, the sort of rebel contingent because we produced this bit of footage which they felt enormously grateful for because it had raised international recognition about their plight. And, um, because that we, because of that, we felt very familiar with the, the opposition fighters, and so for us it wasn't a, wasn't a difficult decision. They were they were very familiar with us. They were very comfortable with us, and um, they were desperate for journalists. And we we just happened to be in the right place at the right time with the with the right people. Okay, let's see the consequences. I'm on uh, uh, one of the rebel soldiers' uh, pickup trucks and we're uh, still paddling through Tripoli with absolutely no sign of any resistance. Uh, ahead of me, there's uh, the rest of the convoy and the people who've been, uh, there have been just everywhere we've gone, people have been pouring out onto the streets in celebration. In fact, most of the time you can't hear yourself think and I'm only wearing this uh, helmet and the bulletproof breast, not because I feel in any danger whatsoever, but because there are so many bullets flying around as they're firing off into the air, these celebratory uh, volleys of shots, and I don't want any of them landing on me. Uh, and that's the only reason why I'm wearing it. It, it feels absolutely safe. The rebel soldiers have simply just driven into the capital, and whatever the laws Compound, you can see 
The emblematic uh, hand crunching the American Apache helicopter. The place is filled with opposition fighters and soldiers, absolutely crawling with them. They set his tent on fire, uh, and they're inside bringing down his posters. They are all over the place. I mean, this is well and truly taken over by opposition fighters. We are at the north, we are at the north end, the north gate. I've just come from one of the south gate and the east gate. They breached the east gate as well and got near uh, one of the sun houses. In fact, they were in his house. Uh, but this is the, the main one, which has caused much of the focus of attention. Uh, hundreds of people all over the place celebrating and believing that if there was any doubt at all, this is very much the end of the Gaddafi regime. Not bad. Um, um, I want to uh, invite you to ask some questions. Actually, I've just got one more for. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll let me let me get you in. Yeah. Don't yeah. Shall I wait for them? Guess you can all wait. The rule is one question, please. One question, and wait for the mic. If that's okay. One question only. Oh. I know what you like, you lot. <laughs> I won't be the first person to say that, uh, yep, that uh, you know, your work in Libya this year is just beyond extraordinary. Um, it's a kind of two-part question, but I'll have it. Um, first part, then. Okay. Um, first of all, the technology that Sky had, particularly that last clip, I think is interesting, though, because that cut you one step ahead of all the other broadcast organisations. And also, I think you've been very modest about your level of preparation, because I think if I understand right, and it would be, I think, interesting to hear a bit about um, the work that you had done in preparation f uh, for the, the final push, because you'd kept in touch with a lot of people over a period of months preparing for this moment. Well, I kept in touch with them because it was very difficult to be trapped in a mosque when we're all thinking we're going to die and not feel bonded with some of them. And I still feel, um, I mean, when, my, um, when Stuart, uh, Ramsey and Martin went back to Tripoli when Gaddafi was finally killed, um, they were still bumping into doctors who were saying, where's Alex? Is she all right? Did she, did she make it? You know, um, and I, I, I felt quite a, as I said, I felt, we all felt a, a real moral duty to make sure that we, those pictures got out because it was so important to those people. They were desperate for us to get the, the pictures out. Um, and even whilst I was there, when Bo I'd be making phone calls in, on, on live on air, and then it would cross to the people in the Rixos Hotel who were saying, no, the Gaddafi regime said they've got Zawir. It's all under control. There's no problem at all. And then they'd cross back to me, and all you could hear was boom, boom, boom. So we felt a big um, responsibility. But I, I don't know, preparation. I kept in touch with those people, and then when we returned, we were constantly, you know, people constantly coming up to us, offering to help us and saying, oh, Sky News, yeah, you know, where can we, can we take you? Do you need food? Do you need water? Handing over stuff to us because they were not only incredibly grateful, but they wanted to, they, I mean, a lot of people saw us, said that they felt we were a good luck charm. And it was kind of, you know, they, and, and they kept on saying every time you come to Libya, thing, good things happen, which kind of sort of coincidental. But they were there were loads of people who wanted to help us. So we weren't in short. There was no shortage supply of people who were wanted to to help us. And the technology, I think, is the technology. Well. We've got no different technology to anyone else. We just used it differently. You know, we, we, everyone goes, for the whole of the Arab Spring, everyone was using Bigans because they look like laptops. They're very portable. You can carry them in the back of rucksacks. Most of the time, we were running with the thing in the back. Um, Andy Marsh, who's our producer, just came up with an ingenious plan of plugging. The, the big problem with the Bigan is that you can't use it without it draining the battery. Mm -hmm. He managed to get around that by plugging it into the pickup truck cigarette charger. So we had no problem with the, the battery, the power. Secondly, we were moving so slowly, he was able to maneuver it so that he, he kept in line with the satellite. But anyone could have done that, frankly. Any one of the other broadcasts could have, could have done it. Um, I mean, when, when Andy suggested it, we all thought, you're crazy. It's never going to work. And somehow we managed to do it. Um, OK, thank you. This one here. Uh, my name is Ahmed Shibani. I am from Masrata. And uh, I'm the founder of the first political party post Gaddafi. It's called the Democratic Party. I would like to take this opportunity to pay homage uh, and gratitude 
for uh, projecting our uh, desperate need for change. It's long overdue. And I want you to know that for 42 years, I have waited for that day. And it was very emotional when you were marching in Tripoli from Zawiya. But um, many people had negative connotation about the Libyan revolution, that it was washed with uh, Al-Qaeda. Mm. Being a woman, how did you feel among Libyan rebels in comparison with the fact that you had experience with uh, extremists like Taliban and so on? How would you assess the treatment of the uh, Libyan fighting revolutionary forces in the front line towards women? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much for your words. I, know I can uh, only imagine the emotion that uh, a lot of, lot of you went through. It was a, it was a very emotional time. Um, and of course now you've got a big challenge of trying to get it all right. Um, but um, we knew straight away that we're, they weren't Al-Qaeda. The very first moment we walked into Zawir, uh, I saw a load of people instantly who were n I knew were not Al-Qaeda. They were civilians. Um, they looked like civilians, they acted like civilians, they dressed like civilians. Uh, they were absolutely, it was obvious that was a propaganda thing put out by Gaddafi. So we didn't feel at all um, worried on that score. Um, secondly, the entire time I was there, the Libyan people were extremely um, protective of me. Um, I was usually, on, on a lot of the protests, the um, only woman there. Um, because the women were not taking part in the protests. Um, and they were just, as I mentioned, they, want, they, they were handing over things. I remember once, when we, when we finally got to Tripoli, and there was a big shortage of food and water. And it seems crazy now because we know what happened, but at that time people were beginning to panic because there was no food and water, and they were fighting over bottles of water. There was none in the hospital. This was the day after Green Square was taken when there was, it was far more dangerous the following day than it was that night going into Green Square because the rebels were in control then. The next day, they s slightly pulled back and the Gaddafi forces moved in and there was lots of fighting all the way around, critical shortage of food and water. Um, and we went out to try and, after about the second day, we went out to try and find some. We couldn't take it from the hospital. There were injured people there who couldn't even get out of their beds trying to get food and water. Um, and we were taken by someone who we didn't know. We were helped all the time by strangers who took us to a shop, opened up the shutter. We had a conversation about, I'm sorry, we don't have um, Libby and Dina, will you accept dollars? It was all lost in translation. He said, yes, help yourself to anything. We piled everything we could into the car because we were trying to feed two teams, the Stuart Ramsey team and, and our team. So we piled as much water, as much tuna, because the place was only seemed to be filled with tuna. <laughs> they liked tuna, right? <laughs> um, and and yeah, and pasta, and dried pasta, and just filled it up, and, uh, and then came to pay. And the guy said, no, 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 you're Sahaf Sahafi. You're a journalist. We can't take anything. You know? And it was, T you've got, to, these are people who didn't have anything. You know, they, they, they didn't have any money anyway. And they were just, no, take. And I, I wondered whether that would ever happen the other way around. You know, if Libyan journalists came to report on the London riots, <laughs> whether people, people would open up their doors. I mean, in, in the hospital, we didn't have anywhere to stay. And one of the doctors said, um, not only let us stay in the hospital, in the Gaddafi ward, which was all super new and no one had ever used it, but then after that, we needed to have a safe house. And I said, do you know anywhere, any floor that we can lie on, anything? He gave over. They moved out and let us have their flats, two flats. I mean, it was astonishing generosity. Astonishing generosity. So. Okay, uh, down here. Uh, hello, um, my name's uh, Alex as well. Um, good I'm a, name. Good name, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, trainee, a trainee journalist, and um, you, your, your whole career, your life in general, obviously is an inspiration to all of us. And... Um, I was just wondering, uh, firstly, who, who, I mean, you kind of touched on this a bit, but um, who do you say your kind of main inspirations were when you were, when you were like my age or even younger, you know? How old are you? Uh, Youngish, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 21, uh, yeah. And uh, also, I was just wondering how, what you feel about how the influence of, say, social media, say, on the Arab Spring... One, one, one question. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. First bit then. Well, my inspirations have changed all the way along. 
Um, they started off with people like Michael Burke, who still is an inspiration, but obviously isn't now on um, isn't on, on on telly much now. But uh, he was very inspiring at the beginning. And I remember when I wanted to be a foreign correspondent, I was watching people like Matt Fry and thinking, I really want to be do that. I've got to, uh, some, sooner or later I'm going to do that. I seemed to. I, w I was a very slow starter, and it took me ages to actually do the job that I wanted to do finally. But um, I loved my job all the way along. It was just that was the goal at the end of it. But now my inspiration now are, are much more my contemporaries. So, you know, I think when I go when we go out on the road, I mean, my own colleague Stuart Ramsey, I think, is one of the best journalists in in Britain, and he's a, a, a real strong competitor. We're very good friends, but he's a very strong competitor. Um, so I'm constantly having to watch my back with him. <laughs> and Bill Neely from ITN, I think, is not only an incredible, really nice bloke. He's an amazing journalist and so I'm um, now I'm watching the people who I'm working alongside and thinking God how did they get that and I must work a bit harder and I must do you know they've done really well on this um, so I'd say Bill um, Stuart uh, they're the main ones because they're, they're very good both of them are very good you, you mentioned earlier on the that you were rejected time and time mm -hmm. again and that persistence is really really important for these guys I would say probably yeah absolutely definitely I've got turned down four times for foreign correspondence job and um, um, you know uh, you didn't give up well you can't give up if you really really want yeah. it because then well, then you've got to be really content with what you're doing right but uh, if you, you've got to keep on striving and keep on going and keep and don't absolutely do not take no for an answer ever because they're always wrong <laughs> <laughs> okay down here please hi good evening so my name is michael and i'm a photojournalist student at westminster university i'm doing an ma um i spent my day with today with uh, james brabazon brabaz brabazon mm -hmm. and i i was just interested and struck by your kind of drawing back from not putting that story of, of your kind of helping and intervening in that situation. I know, I know you, you kind of got to the point of, of saying it was about the story, but and then you kind of never, you never really screened that to the, to the world in terms of your intervention in that situation. And when I was with James today, he kind of said that he helped someone and there were kind of various risks and in that whole process. But I think that kind of human interaction in helping people is so important so why is that not why doesn't that come across in the press why why well I think probably yeah, because we've had a, w w there's been very bad reaction to the people who have helped and people are terribly <coughs> cynical and particularly in Britain they're very cynical about British journalists at the moment largely as a result of hacking and the big the, the tabloid mess that has been the, the fallout from that everyone's been tarred with the same brush and the reaction when other people have shown that has been not um, a, 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 a positive, well, that's what humans would do. It's been a sort of, they've done that deliberately for the Could cameras. Could it not be positive? Could it not be portrayed in a... Well, I don't know. Do you think, it, how, what would, uh, the, the reaction we've had from Fergal helping, I mean, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I think the reaction has been extremely negative. And even when, um, as I say, Anderson Cooper is the American CNN anchor, when he pulled a, a, a young boy away, he was, on, he was actually filming at the time. He was live. And some guy, some young lad, started getting hit by stones. And he stopped his live, but the cameras were still rolling, intervened, pulled the boy out, and moved to safety. He was even criticized for that. It was like a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. No, so it was seen more cynically that they that they somehow they were doing it to gain attention for themselves or to do it for the cameras. And as I said, I didn't think it would add anything to the story. It would probably detract it and and people would start talking about Alex Crawford bandaging up uh, a rebel rather than watching what was happening in Masrata at that time, which was that they were capturing Gaddafi forces, they were taking a lot of hits, but they were making <laughs> inroads, and this was a city that was under siege for many months. Or, in the end, the only thing you'd remember was, of oh, that reporter who, was, who actually did it, and did she, was it real? Did she actually do it? Did she need to? Or was she just putting it in the story just to show herself, being you know Florence Nightingale type figure? And I sort of think if it detracts from the main story, 
absolutely, why would you want to do that? Because you're losing the message. Hold, hold on, because I really want, there's so many hands up, I want to move on. Actually. Alex, I'm John Beck, and I congratulate you on your brilliant piece in, in my book, <laughs> which went we advanced publication by a month. <laughs> because someone's it was so selling good. their book here now. Uh, cool. Let me um, throw a few BBC quotes at you. Um, uh, journalism is not about the moment, it's about understanding. Uh, the biggest day of the, of the whole story, only the BBC was in city. Uh, the, the Arrow Spring is a marathon, not a sprint. Hmm. These are references that to the like BBC yeah. competition with Sky. By yeah, the way. That, they, that sounds like someone who's a really sore loser to me. <laughs> 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 um, I think the BBC were heavily criticised uh, for their coverage, and, um, and unfortunately everyone in Britain feels they've got a stake in what the BBC does or does not do. And sometimes that criticism is really unfair. They're easy to hit the BBC. Um, and they have still have some of the finest journalists uh, in in the country. And as an orga organisation, it's um, without <coughs> comparison. However, it is very big. It's very unwieldy, and they have far too many people and far too much money to to which they perhaps don't spend as wisely when you're a small unit. And I think actually they need to just relax a bit and realize that they didn't do well and there's no point trying to make up for a, uh, yeah. and trying to try they need to put their hands up and just sort of say well we'll learn from that we'll move on and not try to claim that they've somehow got some sort of coup on the coverage of the Libyan revolution because they got a mobile phone footage and then were able to talk about it from cert it actually didn't matter where you were when that mobile no one was there when Gaddafi was caught no journalist was there a bunch of opposition fighters were there and took pictures on their mobile phone. It didn't matter, at, at, you know, to be honest, it didn't, really didn't matter whether you're in Sirt, in uh, Misrata or in Osterley. You were all still talking about the same footage and that's all that mattered. Whether you were talking about it from the outskirts of Sirt, a long way away from the sewer where he was caught, <laughs> it didn't, or you were in Ostley, actually, frankly, did not make any difference whatsoever. You're still talking about the same dodgy mobile phone footage and no one really knowing what happened. I think you should get off the fence about this. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the microphone in there? Uh, it was yeah. effectively the same sort of question, actually. I don't know, at the time you probably weren't aware, but there was a big storm in social media and in the newspapers about BBC not being there and you going in and the tank, and a lot of scorn for the BBC reporters mm. that weren't there at the time. Partly that and partly just how much of a big battle is there at Sky that you obviously want to use at the BBC? How much of a...? A, a battle between Sky, Sky News and well, the BBC. I, and, and partly the thing you're saying about money, not having money as much, I suppose, at Sky. As well, I mentioned the, the money has. thing because they, they, they think there's a lot, they, there are a lot of comments about apparently how much money Sky has and uh, compared to the BBC, which is ridiculous. I mean, they've got far much, m much more money than us. Uh, and we've, we're a tiny organisation in comparison. There's competition between all the um, television networks as there is between all the newspapers. You need to have competition. <laughs> There's no point uh, um, thinking it doesn't exist. There is a competition. However, in um, war zones, it's a different level of competition. I mean, if, if one of my colleagues got into trouble, Bill Neely, who wasn't working for the same organisation like Bill Neely or anyone else, I hope uh, I would do something to help them. The competition mm. fades away at that point. You're, you're helping a fellow um, person, you know, a fellow you know, Brit, a fellow colleague, someone you know, even if I didn't know them. I would try and help them because they're in a foreign country trying to do an honest reporting job. So. I think, I think it was very unfair that Rupert Wingfield Hayes got so criticised that night, or anyone got cr criticised that night. We, we seized the moment, we were lucky enough with the timing, and as I say, it was much more dangerous the next day, when poor old Rupert was sent in there to try and r somehow redress whatever they thought he'd done wrong. And it was far more dangerous the next day. That's when the competition becomes crazily out of control. You know, and I felt very, very sorry for Rupert because he seemed to take all the flack for just 
for something that was completely out of his control. Um, so I, I, I think there is definitely competition. You need competition, but I hope it's, you know, I'd, I would never, I would never, and I'm pretty sure a lot of my um, fellow colleagues would never take decisions based on I must beat the BBC or I must beat the... I certainly was not thinking that that night. I was thinking, I need to be... This is a story that's happening right in front of us and I, we need to be there to report it. I wasn't thinking, Jesus, I must get ahead of the BBC or ITN. I didn't know where they were. I just knew that we were with people who were powering forward and we needed to stick with them. And it, as I said, it didn't feel um, <coughs> very dangerous. If it, if it felt particularly dangerous or we might have taken different decisions. We could at any time could have take, got off the pickup truck. That actually was more dangerous than staying with them. But, uh, you know, I wasn't, our mo none of our motivation was, oh, we've got to get ahead of the BBC or ITN. We, we felt we just wanted to cover the story at that stage. And the story was unfolding in front of us. OK. Yeah. Hi. Um, Sarah Jusiri from the Roy Peck Trust. Thanks for oh, yeah. name checking us earlier. <laughs> it was nice to meet you yesterday. Um, I just wanted to know what your take was um, on the debate that's raging about young freelancers taking risks in conflict zones such as in Libya. And most of the criticism is coming from more experienced conflict reporters. And also just as a Libyan, thank you again for your coverage on Sky News. It was excellent. <laughs> thank you. Um, I would, when I was particularly in Masrata, um, when we, we entered the, the city which was under siege at the moment, at that time, and we ended up sleeping in the um, basement of uh, the hospital's physiotherapy gym. And the place was filled with people, none of whom I recognized, which is highly unusual. Normally, I would be with a whole load of journalists I knew. You know, we'd, be, we'd be camping next to Bill or Johnny Irvine or a whole load of them. I didn't know anyone. And they were uh, young bloggers, primarily, or uh, kids who, because they were 20-something who had just gone out on an on a instinct or a, a quest for adventure. And I, I was really worried about a lot of them because they were taking crazy risks with no backup. I mean, these young guys, one particular guy who was British, was going out there, got the, out to the front line with no, no backup, no, even no idea who was going to buy the footage. He, he used to come back and say, who do you think, I need your advice, who do you think will buy this? And I was thinking, whoa, you've just taken huge amount of risks with very little experience. You know, I mean, this was, this was quite a challenge. When someone like Tim Hetherington, who's been to all the war zones you can ever think of, can get killed. I mean, I went, I went into Misrata the day that Tim died. And I thought to myself, oh my God, it is so random because he was extremely experienced. I considered him much more experienced than myself. And yet there were these young bloggers just, and it is very random. Whilst we were there, a, a French blogger wasn't working for anyone. He was just blogging, he had gone down the road uh, from the gym where we were staying, got hit by a, um, a random bullet from a, a sniper. We, he, we, when we eventually left on a ship, he came on the same ship and could only move his eyelids at that stage. He was a paraplegic. Yeah, very, very sad. Um, so I, 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 I was stunned by the young people there with no remit, no, no salary, no even idea where these pictures were going. I have no idea what, what drew them there. OK. I think Sorry. my question follows on. I'm Jamie. Just a random punter admired your coverage. I'm here, sorry. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it sort of follows on, and I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot, but having been under fire and knowing what it's like and doing it because it was one's job, because one was in the army, you're not in the army, you don't have to put yourself in danger, and you have four children who you very movingly described as being totally dependent on you. I'm sorry to ask the question, but what drives you to do it? Well, um... I thought one of the people last night in the Rory Peck Awards encapsulated exactly what I feel, is that um, you've got to feel that the risk has been worth it. And one of the things that make you feel that it's been worth it is if you can have some sort of impact. And sometimes that impact might only affect one person's life, two person's life, 
as I say, with something like Michael Burke and Ethiopia, it can have a m huge, big impact. But at the end of the day, you've got to feel that all those risks and dangers were actually worth it. I've got to be able to face, I want to go back and face my children and them to feel that I've done something worthwhile. That's what makes it worth it. And I, I felt that uh, our, our team and a lot of the foreign correspondents who were working in a lot of these extremely hostile environments, not just in Libya, but Egypt, um, Bahrain, um, Tunisia, I thought we were doing something worthwhile. We were reporting. There were people on the ground already sending out YouTube videos, and no one was taking them seriously. It didn't matter until the foreign journalists went in. Every time you saw the mobile phone footage, it'd be qualified by, can't actually verify this, we don't know who's filmed it, we don't know whether it's right. It was only when the foreign journalists started reporting from the ground that people suddenly, now that, that could be bias, it's, you know, it's almost racist, all those sort of things. But the, the bottom line was people started believing it, and uh, that made it worthwhile. Okay, we've got time for two more questions. The microphone's down here, I think, somewhere. Hi, um, oh, Melissa, yet another TV MA student. Um, we had a discussion at university, um, which I'd like to get your opinion on. When Gaddafi was captured, of course, that was accompanied by a torrent of images, mm. video, audio, mm. very graphic, um, depicting his, his capture, his torture, and potentially also his execution. How did you feel about that? Did you think that perhaps um, news outlets here across, th across the world should have held back in showing such graphic images? Mm. I mean, he's, he is what he is, but he's also a human being. Or do you think the public deserved to see it and, in fact, needed to see it? Mm. Well, um, I definitely think the Libyan people needed to see it, just like they needed to see his body in the morgue, or what, the shopping centre, which turned out to be the morgue, because they still didn't believe it. You've got to remember this as a nation there's a whole generation in Libya who do not know life outside Gaddafi, who've lived with uh, propag state TV propaganda and radio propaganda, manipulation. You know that, that saying about the bigger the lie, the more people believe it? That was how he operated. I felt it was very uncomfortable viewing. It was barbaric and it was mob <coughs> rule. And I flinched every time I saw it. And I remember having a conversation with someone as I, was, as I was trying to get to Libya to cover the aftermath of that. Um, and the guy also saying it. And, and I had to say, yeah, it was awful. It was uncomfortable. But remember how many people that guy has killed. Now, I've, I've seen quite a few of the, the, the people he's killed and the injuries he's inflicted. And that is nothing compared to what he's done over 42 years. And yet I feel very emotionally traumatized by just that small little window that I saw. Imagine 42 years of that. You know, it, it's barbaric and all the rest of it, but sort of understandable a little bit. You know, sort of understandable, the <coughs> anger, the rage, the, 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 feel, the feeling of revenge. These guys have lost brothers, sisters, They've been tortured. They've been manipulated. They've, even, even in the hospital where we were, the doctors and nurses were terrified. After we left, many of them, they saw their faces on our report. And when I went back again, I found that one of them told me that he'd been arrested and tortured for two months after, just for talking on our program. Imagine living in those conditions. I mean, we're very, we're very privileged because we're in a society where women can talk, women get educated, men can talk, you can criticize the prime minister, you can, you, you, that is a different world, a very different world. And you've got to keep on remembering it's different standards, it's different way of living. It, they've de been denied an awful lot. And that's a, it's a country rich in resources, rich in resources and most of the population has not benefited from it so there's all sorts of injustices okay last question at the back there. Um, thanks Alex for sharing uh, such wonderful insights in your career as an aspiring uh, foreign correspondent as well um, just want to know, you've been in some incredibly hostile environments and very dangerous ones um, and having been rejected was it four times 
that was before. just for the foreign oh, correspondent. For the, yeah. <laughs> what was it Many more yeah, rejections so, for other yeah, jobs before that. So what was it like? Could you tell us a little bit about what it felt like on your very first foreign assignment and what were you thinking? What were you going through? <laughs> Having made it well, when I became a foreign correspondent yeah, yeah. full time, because I'd done lots of foreign reporting before then, mm -hmm. but um, it's very different um, being parachuted into a country to do a story. I mean, I was lucky enough to you know um, do lots of foreign reporting. I went to Hurricane Katrina. I did the first democratic elections in South Africa, uh, but it's very different actually being based in a country and becoming Asia correspondent, Africa correspondent, whatever, because then you live, breathe, you get to learn much more about the region and you've got much better understanding as a result. When I first went to India uh, in my first official foreign correspondence job, uh, I felt I had a lot to prove because uh, I'd taken, it t it'd been quite hard to get there. And I, what I didn't want to do was cock it up now that I was finally there. Um, so I felt at the beginning uh, I had a lot to prove. And I remember the, fir uh, the first, I didn't want, people make up their minds about you very quickly. So I had to make sure the first few stories were um, substantial. Um, so that Because otherwise I knew that all my bosses and everyone would be watching to see the new person there. Is she going to be any good? And they'd be very quickly making up their minds. That's just how it works. Um, so I had to. So I remember the first time, my first report I did. It was something from India. It was it was about um, uh, a doctor in India who was using illegally using stem cell, um, her own stem cell research to cure to to treat people, and it was having miraculous results. But of course, she was completely unregulated and hadn't handed over her. It wasn't approved by anybody, not even the Indian government. But uh, and I remember I sent it in at something like seven minutes long, and at, at Sky, a long package is about two minutes. <laughs> but um, so I, I felt under quite a lot of pressure. But it was fant it also felt like I was doing the best job ever. Okay, uh, I just want this audience to remember that you've heard Alex Crawford say she's, she would rather eat her own liver than be a <laughs> presenter. Now, uh, are you going to stick stick to this, Alex? Are you, are you, goes, you know, what are you going to be doing in ten years' time? Oh God, don't you fancy no Washington idea. or Brussels or somewhere? Don't a bit fancy more Washington at all right now. Although my children would definitely I'm like sure to go do. there, <laughs> um, um, but uh, Washington feels like it's uh, it's a massive big patch, and you spend a lot of the time standing in front of. Um, uh, you know the White House, not actually getting to any of the places, and I, li I, I like, I like the job that I'm doing now. I think it's uh, it's a great job with, um, you know, loads of adventure. I like living in in, I like living in third world countries. They're much more interesting, much more gritty. Um, we're certainly glad that you do. <laughs> I, I think you can probably tell by the mood of the room. You've been really inspiring, Alex, and you're inspiring to a lot of people. I think. I'd like to thank uh, David and the team from the College of Journalism, uh, Millie uh, and everyone from the Frontline Club, but most of all, Alex Crawford. Thank you.